jump in if there are any questions that particularly need answering. Otherwise, we can wait to the end. Anybody can ask questions in the GoToMeeting uh, questions window or in the Slack channel at SQL, uh, SQL PSVC underscore QA. And if you could uh, press the Start Recording button, uh, store it once you are ready. We would That's appreciate. recording now. We're up there and going. Well, you minimize some bits so I can see my screen. There we go. I hide some bits. Right. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening to everyone, depending where you are. Um, yep. So today I'm going to be talking about backups, restores, and DBA tools, and also some general basics behind SQL Server backups, just to make sure everyone knows the issues you can come up with when you're trying to automate restoring. Um, there you go, get PowerPoint working. Um, just my me slide, I've been doing this for about 20 odd years. Um, I run the East Midlands Past chapter in the UK. I help run the annual SQL Relay series of conferences that happens in the UK once a year. Um, my contact details are there. Um, feel free to tweet or mail me if you get any I'm questions so afterwards so that we don't I'm so sorry, Stuart, I don't see your screen. Uh, don't? You don't no. I was just about to ask to say, that I'm, I'm on a very, very slow internet connection. So no, no. no. I don't. Turned, so. Ah, sorry, I thought when Rob handed over. Sorry. Can you see it now? <laughs> Thank you. I yes, can see it now, Thank yes. You. Yes. Go back to the me slide, sorry. I thought when you handed control that gave everything. But yeah, so I've been banging on about PowerShell and backups for quite a while now. Um, so just getting more and more advanced it goes on. Um, so backups, aren't they a little bit dull? Well, yes and no. A good backup should be simple to perform. Anything that's overly complex tends not to be that stable. It gets very fragile. They should be reliable and they should be trustworthy. But a good backup protects your job. In my opinion, the worst thing a DBA can do is to not be able to recover data. If it breaks, it's an unfound outage if you can get it back and all the data is safe. The minute your business can't trust the fact they put data into this expensive database and they can't guarantee they can put it out at some point in the future, that should make them very, very nervous. In my mind, that's worse than it being down for a day. At least if it's down for a day, you know your data is safe, you'll carry on. If you've lost something, you can never trust it. Um, so I'm a big believer in having good backups and having regularly tested backups. So just a quick overview of SQL Server's backup modes. Um, there's three recovery models with SQL Server. With simple model, you're selling SQL Server, you don't care about point in time recoverability. Um, basically, your transaction can just wrap around itself on a few rules it has about when it can reuse them. But generally, in simple mode, it will just get to the end of the transaction log, go back to the start, and loop around it. In full mode, your tenancy will say you do care about point in time recoverability. So your transaction log won't be reused until you've taken a backup of it because you've told SQL Server it's important to you, and SQL Server will do exactly what you tell it to. So if it gets to the end of the log and it can't grow and you've not backed it up, it won't wrap around and reuse the log. So this is why your database hangs when it's in full recovery model and you fill your transaction logs. Um, bulk log mode is exactly the same as full. The difference is that some operations, and these are very specific operations, there's a list of them on MSDN, are minimally logged. This means that there is only a minimum amount of data written in the transaction log. Um, but it's not everything. It will still, you have to, if, for instance, if you do um, particular inserts, you have to use a very specific syntax to guarantee they will be minimally logged. Um, so it may work for you, it may not work for you, but you still have all the transaction log overhead. So with those, you have three backup types you can use with SQL Server. You've got the full or a database backup. In this one, all data in your database is written out to disk. All data in the database will include all the system tables, so that's all your column definitions, index definition, everything. So it's a full write out of your, of your database. A differential backup just writes out the data that has changed in your database since the last full backup. These are cumulative, so if you did a full backup on Sunday night, and took a differential yesterday on Monday, that would that differential would contain all the changes since the full backup on Sunday. If you took another differential backup today, that would contain all the changes since Sunday till today. So you don't need yesterday's differential backup. So they can grow quite large over, the, over a week's worth of um, data changes. The log backup backs up your transaction logs. That's what it says on the tin. Um, so full, 
and differential backups only can work with simple mode. Log backups only work with full recovery model and bulk, reco bulk log recovery model, because so otherwise you're not storing anything in the transaction log, you're just wrapping around. So to restore to a point in time, you need the last full backup before that point in time, the last differential taken between that full backup and the point in time you're restoring to, and then all the transaction logs since the differential backup. Um, and if you're recovering a database that's failed, you also need to tell log backup of what remains that database's transaction log. That's a little about the scope of this presentation at minute because I'm assuming you've got a running database. Um, if you don't have the differential backup, you can still run all the transaction logs forwards. It's just you might have a lot of transaction logs to run forward if you're running them every 10 minutes, every day, and you've got to restore seven days worth of them. It will take quite a long time. I've seen people struggle with that one. Um, one of the biggest things people don't see about backups until they dig under the hood is the LSN or log sequence number. As far as the SQL Server backup goes, SQL Server never trusts the file name or the right times on the files. It just doesn't bother. Every single transaction that modifies data within SQL Server is allocated a log sequence number. Um, this is a very large number. I believe it's a number 25 if you're looking at C-sharp data types. So it's huge. It never really runs out. I've never heard of anyone wrapping it. Um, and while it's a number, the only numeric comparison that makes any sense is if LSN A is greater than LSN B, then A happened after B. That's it. Um, comparing the difference in LSN numbers doesn't tell you how much work the database has done. Um, you can't compare LSN numbers between different databases. It means absolutely nothing. All SQL Server uses them for is to say, if this number is greater than that, this happened after that. Um, you will get gaps because the LSN is initially given out when you start a transaction. If it doesn't commit, or doesn't get any further, it's never written into the logs, you don't have it. But this is the one thing SQL Server will use to make sure everything is written in order. And that's important because when you restore a database, SQL Server can only restore as far as it has an unbroken LSN chain. So as you can see there, an LSN chain is exactly what we said it was before, but it really defines which backups you can have. So you need a full backup, that full backup will have what's known as a checkpoint LSN. This is the LSN that SQL Server says the backup ran. Um, and that is then tattooed into every log backup and differential backup that's taken after that full backup as its database backup LSN. This is why if um, someone takes a full backup erroneously during your backup cycle, so one of your devs takes a full backup at lunchtime, they can wreck your entire restore chain for the rest of the day because every transaction log after that will work absolutely fine but you can't restore it because you won't have the full backup they took and smuggled off to their machine um, this is why your devs really really need to be talking about copy only backups if you're going to let them take their own they don't reset this checkpoint or database backup as lsn they are purely a copy um, and if you have a differential that exists, you can just use it to skip all the transaction logs that have occurred before its first LSM value. Um, if I quickly drop to Management Studio and show you some of these. So this is um, the header of one of the files I'm going to be using in the demo in a bit, in a minute. Um, this happens to be a log backup. So here we can see the LSNs within the backup. So you have the first LSN, this is the LSN the backup started. Last LSN is the LSN where the backup completed. And database backup is that large number there. Is this a full backup? No, this is a transaction log backup. Um, the checkpoint LSN is the same just because of the way I created the database, but this transaction log can only be restored onto the full database backup with that LSN. 
if you have one with a different one, then it can't be restored. That's how it breaks. Oops, go backwards. The only way to reliably guarantee you can read this header is using SQL Server's restore header owner fun functionality. Um, I've tried to find some shortcuts. I wrote quite a long blog post on this just before Christmas. Basically, if you're not using compression or encryption, you can sort of do it. They're in a known place. You read the file in bytes. Then you can pick out these LSNs. But the minute it's compressed or encrypted, then you haven't got a chance. Um, so it's not reliable enough, so I didn't put it into the code that I'm going to show in a minute. So with that out of the way, I'm going to move on to some demos. So I'm going to start with some backups using the new DBA tools functionality. So let's make sure I've got everything. So I have multiple copies of the module on my machine, so I'm just making sure I'm using the one I want to. So just to keep things nice and clean while I'm running through the backup examples, I'm going to use splatting with the variables. If you've not met this before, this is a really handy, neat way of passing in parameters to a function. So here I've just created a hash table with um, some key value pairs. So a key of SQL instance, the instance is going to run on, so it's a local SQL Express instance on my laptop. A database, this is AdventureWorks 2012 that I've run Jonathan Cahiers's, um make big script on. So it's made up to about half a half a gig, I think, in size. So it actually takes some time to back up. And the directory, I'm going to throw all the backups in just so I know where stuff is to delete it. So if we just set that, bring this up, you can see some output. So it's simplest. You can see we just run a backup. You can get a nice progress bar. It tells us where it's backing it up to. And that will just chunter away. And then we return you some information about the backup. So you can see we've told you the backup's completed, which database it was, what the SQL instance was, name of the file, its folder, the full path to that file. And we also give you the script. So if you wanted to repeat this, or you want to keep a check of when things ran, you can do that. So that's all fairly simple. Um, as you saw, it's quite slow. So one thing we offer you is striping. SQL Server allows you to write out your backup files to multiple files. So rather than just writing to one large back file, you can write it to a number of files. Um, I think there's a limit of 64. And we offer you the way of doing that either with a file count parameter or by specifying multiple backup paths. Um, Multiple backup paths are quite common. You'll write to multiple storage arrays, for instance, or multiple drives on your machine. Uh, this gives you much higher throughput because you're hitting multiple disk controllers. So what I'm just going to do here is use the PowerShell measure command to see how long it takes to do the play and backup. Add the parameter file count equals four to my backup and then measure it again to see how long that takes. So now for a quick comparison, um, the first run took 14.3 seconds, the second one took 11.2. So that's not a huge increase, but this is quite a small database. This can make a big difference on a large database when you push stuff out. And we return, I'll just show you this. When you stripe with the file count, we automatically append one of X to all your backup files. So it's easy to see that they're all from the same backup and which ones they are. Because if you store from a Stripe backup, you need all the files. You can't get away with three out of four, you need four out of four. Uh, that's a hard and fast rule. So while it improves your speed, it can also cause you problems. Um, just dropping out of splatting now because you can't splat an array which is an annoying oversight I didn't find any until today. 
So now what we're going to do is just back up the backup directory and we're going to split it into two file locations. And that will do much the same, but now we're actually just specifying different locations. So this could be separate drive letters for your backups. The other problem that comes with striping is that it goes at the speed of the slowest disk. And if you have a missing disk as well, it will fail. SQL Server won't go, oh, I've got two out of three disks you've told me to use. I'll use those. It will bomb out because it can't see the third disk. Um, this one backs up to a USB drive. And I've had problems with this because my machine keeps auto sleeping my USB drive and it fails. So that's there. If you want to run through these scripts, I'll put all the scripts up online afterwards. Um, if you want to run this yourself, feel free, but it's just my laptop sleeps my uh, USB stick. So that's it. So that's for backups. What about the other types? Well, we can take types of diffs. We can do a differential backup. There we go, and we now have a differential backup. That's my fault. I didn't take a full back. Sorry, I've not reset the machine. That should have failed, and we're just showing you that we were taking no copy-only backups. By default, um, Backup DBA database takes copy-only databases. Backups. Because to stop that problem I was saying, where someone uses this tool to take a cop snapshot of your data to use to populate another instance, and then wrecks your production restore chain, which would really ruin your day if things then failed. Um, so what you have to do, if you want to take a proper backup rather than a copy-only backup, is you just take no copy-only true, and that will then take it. The diff would work, but it would be very fast because there's no modification on data in that size. Now, if we want to take a log backup, that one fails because we're in simple recovery mode. Disk can run there, so we, we could reset that up. So it will stop you. It won't allow you to take a backup that's not supported by the underlying database. The other option we use is that you can verify your backups. Um, SQL Server will write your backups out quite happily for you but you have to tell it to then go back and check it. So with the verify switch here, passing in verify true, it will do the backup and then it will run restore verify only against that backup. Um, it doesn't restore the database back to disk. It just goes through and checks logically that all the data structure within the files and the backed up data make sense. And this will then confirm back to you that it's actually been checked. If we run this, Right, if you're trying to log back up, which it won't do. Sorry, and that red is because I tried to add a hash key value back in to one that already existed. There we go. It now goes to do a restore database for verify only. If we now look at backup output, you'll see that we have some extra fields at the bottom to things it's verified and the verify was successful. Um, so again, if you were running this as part of another script, you get the information back so you can store it somewhere for your auditors or for someone else to see it. So using another piece of the DBA tools tool set, there's a function called get DBA backup history, which lets you see, as it says, the backup history on a per database or per server basis. So this will just show me all the backups taken on Adventure Works. So you go, we've got full backups. 
differential backups, falls, falls, and that's just the ones we've been playing around with this now. It gives you some information about how much was backed up, where it was backed up to. So if we go here, you can see we've got our Stripe backup where it's backed up to four different um, files. And we can use that to get things like the last full backup. So that's all quite handy to get an idea of when the last backup run on a database. But quite often, a more interesting question for a DBA is to show me all the databases that don't have a full backup. So that is coming in Get DBA Database. Um, we're just adding some functionality that adds the no full backup switch. And we'll run against an instance. This would return any database that doesn't have a full backup. At the minute, everything on this instance has a full backup. So let's just create something. There we go. We now have a database with no backup, called no backup, just to make life really simple. So if you came across that, you could fix that quite easily with making everything work the PowerShell way, where you take the output from one commandlet, pipe it into another commandlet. You don't have to save it or do any work with it. So here we just take that get DBA statement and pipe it straight into backup database. So you just put the backup in to see DBA tools backup, create a folder with the database name, and to do a proper full backup, so no copy only. So there we go, we've got a backup. No backup folder containing our full backup. And if we now look for things without a full, no full backup, we're back to a good place. Everything on there has got a full backup. Now, that only counts for things that have never had a full backup. However, you might have something with a stale backup somewhere in your estate. So to me, a stale backup is one that was taken longer ago than you'd like. So for instance, I don't like seeing databases under a certain size, sorry, database every certain size that don't have a full backup within the last 40 hours, because that tends to mean the restore is going to take a very long time, so we lose our recovery time objective. So we've added the no full backup since parameter that lets you pass in a date time. So here I'm just going to pass in, tell it to look from five minutes ago. So this will return some databases. So again, it's returning a lot of my test databases because they've not been backed up for an hour since I last ran through my demos. Um, but obviously you could quite easily change this to add days minus seven to look for anything that's not had a backup in the last week. And again, you can pipe that output straight through into backup DBA database. So it's a little back check if you find something that's a bit out of date and you want to quickly get it. Okay, that ends backup. So now we'll just quickly go back to PowerShell for a couple of slides. Um, so restore problems. I've tried and written many restore automation tools over the years. Um, you started off trying it in T-SQL. Um, as the description of this event said, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and you run into lots of very fragile um, T-SQL statements that build themselves and XP command shell hell as things don't work quite the way you expect. So PowerShell, when it came out, was a real um, happy place for me to find out how to use these. And as I've been writing things over the years, I found there's a couple of issues that a lot of scripts don't take account of and that you need to handle because they do happen. Um, you need to ensure you've got a valid restore chain. It's a waste of time for the person running the restore if you restore the first 20 of 40 files and then find out you're missing the transactional file in the middle. They've probably wasted a lot of time restoring all that lot. If you'd have stopped them at the beginning, maybe 10 minutes to find the file on tape, put it back in its place and rerun the restore. Um, you should cope with the database already existing in a nice way. Basically, if it already exists and the user's not told you to clobber it, don't clobber it. Um, 
should be able to cope with file moves and renames. Um, quite often you may have files on a, a server, you're restoring from server A to server B, the file names may already be in use on server B and you don't want to go over the top of those, especially if you're um, using this to repopulate test instances, for example, or for fault finding on a separate server. You need to cope with new files appearing. Um, when you're rolling through database backups, especially when you're doing transactional backup restores, the SQL Server is actually replaying all the transactions. So files will shrink and grow because that's a logged event. And also if you add a new file, that will suddenly appear during a log backup restore. Um, I've seen some ones where they just look at the very first backup, go, oh, those are all the files I've got to deal with. And then when another data file is added halfway through the day, it has a little bit of a problem. Should we have to perform point in time restores? Quite often people want to say, I want to restore to an hour ago before my problem occurred and see what was happening. It shouldn't worry about backup file names, just because everyone has a slightly different naming convention depending on the tool they're using. And sometimes people mock them up by mistake. Um, I've seen people try and copy data files and the names are no longer useful to a human. Um, it should cope with striping. It's very common for people to use that now for performance. And it should cope with multiple backups in a single file. I've seen a number of cases over my time where someone's pinched a backup script from somewhere on Tinternet and they've been running it and not realized it's been backing up all the backups into one humongous backup file. And I mean, they'll have full backups, differential backups and transactional backups going to this one huge file. And I've seen those one, I remember someone only found out about it because it was many years ago and it hit the file system limit. This is back in the days of early NTFS and then they realized what was going on. So you need to cope with that because they still want to be able to restore that data. So with that in mind, we'll go back to the demos and show you where we're trying to do things with the DBA tools to cope with every one of those. So first off, what's probably quite common to a lot of people, just a folder with some backs and some TRNs. Um, this particular folder happens to be a um, two full backups and transaction logs. Shall I do a quick digression onto those? Um, all the I'm going to find my scroll bar. All the databases I'm using in here are very simple. Um, create a database, put it into full recovery mode. I create a quick table called steps um, with an integer and date time column. Declare an integer. And then step through, and every 30 seconds, I write in the integer count and the timestamp into the table. And then every five minutes, I take a backup of some sorts. So this means I have a range of backups. And when I re do restore point in time, I can check that the database thinks it's at the right time. And I've just created a couple of different ones. So um, restore clean is just a very simple two full backups and some transaction logs. That restore time diff has a diff in it and there's some others that we'll go through to go through again I'll let you have all the scripts to create these at the end so we have the files so it's simplest we're just going to restore the very first back file so this is just restoring a simple back we're going to restore it to MySQL Express 2016 on localhost we're going to restore it to the database name test restore so we don't clobber the other one and we're going to redirect all the database files into CDBA tools test rest to again avoid any clobbering of my running database. Yeah, it's a nice progress windows. And again, we return you some useful information. You have a SQL instance, database name, my username. Um, whether you told it to not recover, whether you told it to replace an existing database, restores completed. It's restored one backup file. It's restored two data files. Uh, backup file was restoreclean.bak. The restored files were restoreclean.mdf and restoreclean.log.rdf. Restored into CDBA tools test rest. And also, we give you the T-SQL script to do the same thing again. So if you want to repeat this but not use PowerShell, you could do it with the T-SQL. Um, we also offer you the option to just have the T-SQL. 
So if you just want to see what's going to do, if you say output script only, it will go through all the all the checks of the files and all the validation of your backups. It just won't write anything to disk. Ah, I'm not. Yes. It does that check as well because it puts the replace statement into the T-SQL. So it has to check that you actually wanted to replace it, otherwise it would be an error. So that's just a nice handy little thing if you want to see what's going under the hood and just check that it's logical if you're doing a complex restore. So now we're just going to pass in, rather than the file, we're just going to give it the directory. So what this will do by default is scan all the backup files in that folder and work out which ones it needs to do to restore to get to the latest point in time those backups consist of. There you go. So for a quick look here. It's worked out I need to restore the number two backup file, the two one transaction log, the two two transaction log, and the two three transaction log which is what it needed to do. As you can see, for everything apart from the last file, it's been saying no recovery is true. So it knows not to do the recovery until it gets to the very end. So that's quite nice and simple. Um, so what about if you want to restore to an exact point in time? So in this date, with these examples, I know this database was being backed up between 12.58 and 13.13 today. Sorry, yesterday. So I'm going to tell it to do exactly the same as before, except I'm going to put restore time on and just pass in a date time parameter here. And here, I'm just going to run invoke SQL command 2 to get the maximum date for my steps table, just to show that it's restored it to the point in time. So there we go. That would be the closest it got because it drops them in every drop say row in every 30 seconds so the next one would have been three seconds past my restore time so if i'd gone down to second resolution on restore time i'd have got the next one so we can see that's an early one in my list which so just restored the first full backup and then the first transaction log because that's all it needed what happens if we picked a slightly later date Again, the time marries up with the time I'd asked it for, but this time it's known to skip past the earlier backups. So I scroll up too far. So it's known to skip through those and just come through and restore enough to get it through to the last point in time. So now I've got a exactly the same copy as that, of that database except it has a diff in the middle so this time we we'll just use the output script only so it'll make it slightly easier to run back through it so in this case that's restoring to a point in time just before the differential was taken so if you saw the full backup the first transaction log the second transaction log backup and the third transaction log backup the next one is just after the diff has been taken. So in this case, we can see it's taken the first full backup, the differential backup, and then the first log file after the differential backup. So it knows it can skip the first transaction logs and only needs the one after the differential. I'm sorry, I could have done the... Uh, I know what that found. There goes. So again, it's within 30 seconds of restore time, which is the granularity for this database. So there's quite a lot that goes under the hood of um, restore DB database. It's a wrap around a lot of other functions going down that route that is being pushed down the path of the community of writing functions that do one job well and reusing them wherever you can. 
So if you run it with verbose, you'll get a lot of information as it goes through. You can see it starts from restore DBA database, goes to directory store file to pick up the files, it reads backup headers, it filters them, it restores them. There are various tests and restoring database from filtered arrays. Um, there is here a flow chart of how it goes through all the different functionality. Um, and one benefit of move, moving to this architecture is that it's very quick to add new ways of looking at files or new rules. So if something else wants to be checked, we can very quickly add another function in here before we get to the bottom. Um, so one thing I was saying about us relying on the LSNs, use the back in here and restore clean. If we just set the last write time on get restore time clean to now, it's quite a way out from where everyone else is. But the benefit we have is because we're not, like, unlike some solutions, we're not relying on the actual file's timestamp, we don't care. We will just blast past that file stamp and still restore it properly. So if you've had a file recovered back from tape, and they've not got the file creation dates right, you don't have to worry, this will still sort it out for you. And again, you can have problems. If we have a look in here, we have a single backup file. Um, you know, it's not huge, but it looks like it's a single backup. If we actually run restore database against that, it's passed that single file and found out there's a full backup and a number a diff file and then a number of transactional files in there that need to be restored. So this is where I was saying you can get this problem where people back everything up into a single file, they don't know about it. But they still want to be able to restore. We can cope with that. This is just picked up. And in fact, this um, backup file has the same backup structure as the ones we've been doing before. So it's got a full backup, two transaction logs, another full backup, three transaction logs. So we've been able to run through that, find the latest backup file in there, and then all the transaction logs back up afterwards. Can I just say, hell yeah, that's super awesome. And thank you. That makes it so much more convenient. That's it. I've, 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 gone into places blind when they've asked me to fix things and just found this terabyte and a half backup file and the database is two gig and it's like we need to recover it to yesterday and you need to pass it so yeah this is just making life easier for everyone thank you so much okay so you just take a sip of water um so at the minute we've just been reading in raw files or raw directories. Um, but we do support some other ways of getting the files in. So the first and most common one is Ol Hellengren's great maintenance solutions. Um, I expect many of you have seen these. Um, certainly I use them a lot. It's very reliable and very easy to use. So here we go. Classic, I've got a full folder with some full backups in and the log folder with some transaction logs back up in. Um, if you use the maintenance solution backup switch, we automatically know you're talking about an Ola Hallengren backup. So we look under the path you provided and we look for the full, the log and the differential backups. And then we just process those. So that will just go through. One benefit of using the maintenance backup solution switch for all Hallengrim backups is we will shortcut if we cannot find a file in the full directory we just stop because we trust his scripts will always put them in the right location we can't always trust everything out there because we don't know how you've homebrewed your maintenance solutions or your own scripts but if you tell us it's a Hallengrim script we will check if the full backup 
is empty, then we will just say, no, you've got a problem, you need to go and fix it before we start trying to waste any more of your time. The next common one people come across from is when you yourself do not have permission to see your backups, but your SQL Server instance can do. I've seen this before, um, you know, the SQL Server service account has permission to write to a UNC share, but your normal day-to-day -day user account can't see it. So what we've offered is, assuming you have it enabled on your remote server, is the XPDIA tree switch, and this will go off and use XPDIA tree to scan the files. And this will also work with um, remote instances, which I couldn't, I'm sat at work in a small office at the moment, and the only remote instances I've got to, they would not like me having a demo on. Um, but if you specified, you know, my big server and want to read files off of its C drive, then you can use XP Deer Tree on there. Um, so it just means you don't have to physically be on a box. So it saves a lot of time. Um, just a little bit of overhead. All of our switches do a little bit of sanity checking and we just look for back and TRM files. We take pipeline input for files and here you can pass in anything. Um, I created a quick set of backup files which, as you can see, are not your standard backup file names. Um, I don't think any of them got the right in indexes or anything. But to be honest, we don't actually care. Again, because we're reading the raw contents of the file, you can name them whatever you want, and we will still pick them up and process them. So this is great if you've got a mass of files and you don't know what's going on with them. Again, if you're striping in multiple locations, we can take them in. Here, I've just created some folders with some stripe backups in. Get, child, and the two. And we'll just pull them from, we'll pull everything in from both and we'll match them up. So Stripe backups don't need lots of typing in. Because obviously when you normally do a Stripe backup, you have to tell it all the disk files each time. We'll just put that together for you. If you want to cope with um, file creation, so I've created a backup where a file was created and then deleted, but across backups. If we just run a point in time restore, I just thought that was going to be better. Make sure you do it. So you see, as we go through here, every time it's just restored two files, the MDF and the LDF. If we go to a specific point in time, Here you can see we caught the fact that there was an NDF added that existed for 10 minutes. Um, and this might have been important. It might be someone quickly added an extra file to cope with some work they were doing. And that may be the bit of work that you need to go back and investigate. So you need to be able to restore back to that point in time. So again, we scan all the headers. We also get all the file information back so we can cope with things coming in and out. Um, and to stop you clobbering lots of things, he says, oh, conscious of the time, I'm just going to speed through some of these. <laughs> um, you can prefix all your restored database files with a particular phrase. So here we're telling to restore all of them into restore time rogue file folder, but also prefix them all with restored. So you could pick a unique value for that or create your own timestamp. So that, therefore, you've got no chance of clobbering existing backup, no existing database. You can also pass in destination log directory, which will allow you to restore your log files into a different folder. So any log file that you're restoring, that will go in that folder. So if you've got separate drives for data and log, you can split them to your heart's content. Um, if you're moving between um, database instances, say you're doing an upgrade, 
so you're going from SQL 2012 to SQL 2016, um, you can tell it to use the destination default directories, which will query the instance, find out where the defaults are, and push your files into those for you. So if you want to give everything to C program files, Microsoft SQL Server, blah, 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 this will work it out for you so you don't have to. Um, also, we're not bothered whether you're passing one database or many. So here I'm going to pass in two sets of database backups, one for restore time clean, one for restore time diff. I can't give a database name now because it wouldn't make sense with two databases going in, so we're just going to prefix them all restored. There we go, and we've got two databases coming through, restored, okay, restored, 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 restored time diff, and restored, restored time clean. Um, and there's no limit. The only thing we have at the moment is every database has to have a unique name. I do have a cunning plan to get around that, but it's at the bottom of a very long list. So that's files, but going back to us passing functions across, uh, we can just take, a real quick note, Stuart, if you can hear me. Um, I yes. think that backups and restores are so important that we will grant you additional time uh, if you have it. Uh, we do have a number I, of I questions. Have... Was that? Okay. Awesome. We yep. do have a number of, of questions, and even if the person who has asked the question uh, has to leave, uh, we will be, as you know, recording this session and putting it up on YouTube. So feel free to take as much time as you like, and we will get to the okay. questions, and then we'll post everything up on YouTube. Oh, that, that's brilliant. Thanks for that. And, you know, no, I've, I've finished for the day. I'm just lurking work. It's got better networking than my broadband at home. Awesome. Um, okay, so yes. So now we've gone through the files. Um, we've written this very much at times with the rest of the tools. So we showed before, get DBA backup history to return information about your back your backups. So I have a second instance on my laptop, SQL Express 2012 instance, and I can get the DBA backup history for the database restore time 2012. So here we have a number of full backups and Uh, type log backups and everything else so that has a full backup history so we can just pass that straight into our restore to restore it onto my local instance okay so we've now restored from our 2012 instance straight into 2016 and we just get we will still take we can still do point in time restores. I just can't remember when that database was created. Start real quick now, before a lot of people have to go. Um, uh, yeah. someone is asking for your email address uh, so that they can contact you. Yep, sir. I'll just type, if I just type it in here while people make notes. Everyone just grab that. Um, And in addition, Stuart is also available on the SQL Community Slack in our channel. So the channel name is DBA Tools, and the SQL Community Slack, you can join it. There's like 2,000 other SQL Server professionals. That's at dbatools.io slash slack. And there's a separate uh, channel for the PowerShell virtual group, although it does still say um, VC, where you can ask any questions and they'll be held for a little bit longer than the ones held in the go to meeting, which will vanish straight away. Stuart will, I promise, go and ha take a look in there and answer any questions you get over the next couple of days when you're using this. And of course, somebody said, where do we get these tools? dbatools.io is the URL for that. Chris, are you going to do more questions? Oh, there, there's a ton, but I did want, uh, if Stuart, uh, are you, uh, I don't think that Stuart has completed his demo, or, or did you? Well, if he, uh, no, I've got, I've got a few more bits to go through, but obviously if people have questions sure. and are about to head off, I don't mind doing a few now, then carrying on. Okay, Show us cool. The demo. And, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, which one? Oh, no. Okay, answer some questions. So, 
Um, we the first question we've got is uh, answered. Can the command be used if you use all the Holograms backup script that stores full and diff log in different folders, which you've shown? Is there a checksum issue? Got oh, issue option. There is. There is. Yes. Yep, checksum is one of the, the backup issues. Unfortunately, you have to then know how to validate it. So it's there if you do the checksum validation, we'll generate it, but there's not really a demo to show it in use as such. Any plans to support the parameter max transfer size? Um, we certainly can do, yeah. That's, I should add that to the list. So if uh, Lars, if you or somebody could add it to the DBA tools, um, issues on github by uh, if you go to dbatools.io there's a link to the github repository there and if you open an issue you can uh, the link is dbatools.io slash issues thank you chrissy no problem um, like i said that's my last slide as well <laughs> um just a note the difference name is standard for connecting to the sql server uh, yeah, Peter, um, those uh, variants in naming of parameters through DBA tools will be resolved in um, version one, which the release date is, Chrissy, at the moment? Uh, uh, we're hoping for uh, June 1st. Um, and uh, so far, it's on target. We'll know as we get closer. Yeah, that is that, that is something that there's no standardization. However, I can say this that store its commands uh, do support dash SQL instance, even though uh, the examples use dash SQL server. So even though there isn't a very consistent feel across the parameter names and even the command names, uh, we did put in a bunch of aliases so that uh, it would still work. Um, could you, uh, Stuart, go through um, what the requirements are on the client to be able to run this? Um, you will need, basically, if you, get the, if you download DBA Tools the module, DBA Tools comes with SMO, doesn't it? Oh. Sorry, DBA Tools what? So, so um, no, the, it, you, you need to have shell version three or above and oh. you need to either have management studio or the SMOs SMO. installed on the client machine. Yes. Um, it will connect to any version of SQL from uh, 2000 up to vNext on Windows yeah. and on Linux for vNext. And um, so, so storage, storage Windows commander. 7 onwards. Right. Yes. So, well, so and storage PowerShell commander. version three. Yeah, are, are yeah, available. Yeah. So storage commands are available within uh, the DBA Tools module, and if you go to dbatools.io/install, uh, we there is an in-depth blog post about the minimum requirements, and we we actually had a community member, Sam, just up uh, update the. Uh, the web page today to list very straightforward the minimum requirements there. That's at dbatools.io slash download. And it is indeed Windows 7 uh, with PowerShell 3. And then on, this is strictly on the client and then SQL Server 2008. Uh, on the server, the minimum requirement is no PowerShell and SQL Server 2000. So, we have, we've tested all the... Go on. We, I believe, we've tested all the sequ the backup and restore stuff has gone back to two thousand. Correct. We've that, that is so. Right. So that's yeah. something that so, we yeah. always we always try for. So sorry. <laughs> Apologies. I've got a mute button on my um, headphones, which, if I lean forward, mutes me against my desk. <laughs> um, somebody asked. Uh, so it's does DBA does DBA tools have functionality to restore CDC enabled DBs and piecemeal? Piecemeal, not at the moment. And CDC, I'd have to have a play with. I think the problem with piecemeal is it's quite a complex operation. Um, so it's trying to you know how we can handle that complexity. So I think we'd have to put some effort into that of not making it so complex you might as well just go into T-SQL but coping with the fact that people doing piecemeal restores tend to have very specific needs um, and yeah I'll have to look into CDC 
it should do because we just under the hood it's just running transact sql restore statements awesome thank you so much okay i lost the rest of the questions on my screen and i'm trying to scroll up real quick um, hey, oh yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, th there's actually two of them. So uh, if you Stripe backup files, is there a recommendation for the number of files, uh, like one file per core? Uh, potentially, yes. A lot, oh, I'll have Slack open. Um, a, yes, a lot will depend on your architecture, your machines. And you, yeah, if you've got enough to get a, IO thread per core out to a different device, then yes, that will fly. Um, you may find you don't have that sort of bandwidth. So there can be a little bit of playing with it to find out. But remember, the more stripes you have, the more chance you've got of losing one of those stripes. So if you've only got two stripes, 50-50, they're both there. If, you, if you've got 64 stripes going, mm -hmm. That's a lot more drives that can fail or be having a bad day. Um, and again, it depends. If you as well, the other benefit is I can't couldn't demo it because I'm running Express here, but we support Compress. So for a lot of instances now, that Compress is available since 2008 R2 in all editions. That will also give you a huge benefit. So you may find that if you compress and just do two stripes, you'll get the throughput you're looking for. So it's not necessarily uh, 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 correlated to the cores, but to the CN and network, correct? Oh, that's exactly, yeah, yeah. Basically, you, you're always going to go at the speed of the slowest disk you're writing to. Cool. So everything needs to be fast. Another really you, interesting you can, question. You can make it quicker. You, you can make it, the backups to a slow network share quicker by striping them. But it's not going to get away yeah. from the fact that the network share is slow no no so, not at all no no yeah uh, there was another question that that i actually don't know the answer to i i hadn't tested it i had only tested the backups the the striped backups is a restore from a striped backup set faster slower or the same speed as a restore from a non-striped backup faster good question it should be faster because again you're, you're pulling it, you normally I/O bot bound on a restore, so if you can pull the, the I/O through faster, you'll restore faster. In, but in my test, in, in my testing, it's been faster. Awesome. Yes. Are you still going to be limited by the speed of the disk you're writing to? Yes. And I don't know if we had covered it, but <laughs> someone says, "What about doing a restore with checksum? Also, to list any backups taken without checksum." That comes from Patrick. Ooh, we could probably do that with um, to get a list of all the backups without checksum. That sounds that's like a command. In, that's it. That would go into to get DBA backup history. Yeah, totally. I would agree. Mm -hmm. So we would pull that from the back set, the backup set information. Um, and yes, we should be able to restore with checksum. Yeah. Again, it it will, it will just be one of the properties. Um, do you know? Do you know if checksum is currently uh, in the restore back? Uh, sorry, yeah, the the get restore or sorry, the get backup history command. I don't know. Um, if not, uh, then that's something that you guys can go to to, to dba tools io slash issues yeah. that'll redirect you to the GitHub repository, and then you can put in your request there. And all of our requests uh, are sent to Stuart, thank God, <laughs> <laughs> and he he takes care of them quite promptly. He's amazing. Stuart, uh, you might know the answer to that, this yeah. one as well. Um, the, uh, if, you're, if you take a backup from your uh, production location and then you want to restore it on your development location, but you copy the files first using copy item, how do you make copy item, how do you wait until the files are all there before you start your restore? Oh, so you see, right, okay. Um, I probably just use... If you just write a script, if you just have, let's say you just, let's have a new one. So if you just did backup, copy, restore, yeah, then PowerShell will automatically do this command, then do that command, and it won't start restore until that one's finished. If that makes sense. 
or I yeah, I mean, the question? That's, no, you've, you've got the question exactly right. So um, Tim, who has left, unfortunately, um, does copy item path files, destination local files with a recurse and says that um, PowerShell then tries to run the command immediately, but even if the file's not there. That hasn't been my my personal experience, no, has it? Not mine has it been with you guys? Yeah, no. I think that there might be something going on with with his system. Yeah, that, so, it, it, well, yeah, if he's got something like yeah, you know, if he's got a fancy file filer on the end of it, it may be telling him it's done, but it's still in cache. Yeah, or or maybe it's um, it, it's being rehydrated if it's been uh, deduped or something strange like that. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, in my experience, normally if you run commands one, two, three, the, yeah. unless you do something clever with invoke parallel, it's going to go that order. Good. Yeah, Claudio, that was mine so, cool. uh, Claudio had made a comment, and he says on mine too, but I don't know if that's referring to that, that Claudio's experience uh, is that copy item does wait until it's done um, or that he has issues with that as well. So if you could hop in, Claudio, and answer that. Uh, there was another question uh, by a guy named Redwood that said uh, test DBA uh, backup now uses only full backups uh, when uh, when is diff going to be available so that was a command that I wrote um, back uh, before Stuart had joined the team um, and it's kind of uh, it was kind of yeah I mean I only supported full at the time now that we have Stuart's uh, commands that make it way easier for me I will write that uh, rewrite it um, to make a, to make a more robust command, and we may rename it as well. It may just be test DBA backup instead of test DBA last backup. Yeah, I think there's a few backup oddities kicking around that could just be tidied up. So, yeah, yeah. I believe at this time that is all the questions that we have. Uh, you're welcome, Redwood. Um, and so, if Stuart, I would love to see the rest of your demo uh, if you're still available okay. to give it. Awesome. Excellent. That's it. And um, that one for this bit. And again, when we do get DBA backup history, in this one, you pass through one database. Again, we're not bothered if you pass through multiple. So we're going to grab three databases off my 2016 instance, push them to restore, again prefix them all with the restored name and prefix the files so we don't club or anything. Oh and some orange text, that is always a bad sign. Something strange has happened there. It's interesting if actually one of them failed. So I can just take that out and rerun the others. Restore time clean. Hey Stuart, while this is running, just want to let you know we yeah. do have a request uh, to ensure that you show your slides at the end because uh, people are clamoring for your contact info. Okay, no problems. Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly go that one back. Go that back. Right, that's doing something funky with adding the log file many, many times. Um, so if we just skip to the next bit, which will fix this. Um, as we said before, we we rely on the LSN headers, so this means we scan the headers of every backup file we see. So there is some overhead in that, um, especially if you're doing large amounts of files, because each time we scan one, we're passing off to a SQL server to come back. Um, so we do offer, when we're taking input in from one of our own procedures, we do offer the option of trusting the database backup history. Um, when that runs, we don't scan the files, and we do a minimal check for the LS, Oh, pardon me, sorry. We check the file actually exists, we check the LSN chain is correct based on the history passed in, 
and that you're not breaking any of the versioning rules about restoring back between different versions. So it does restore, it does cause that. So it does mean that if your backup history is incorrect for some reason, then you will have problems because it will try to just start the restore then throw out. Um, And that's worked. He says, try not to sound too surprised, but I think the... Pro it, so that will make a bit of a difference. It's not going to be huge. So here we're going to run the same query. Um, one with trust DBA backup, DB backup history, and one without. I'm assuming this first one doesn't error. I don't know what's airing on that log file, but the difference is it's the the seven seconds to five seconds. So on this, we're saving two seconds on the scanning the files, but these only have a couple of log files. If you've been running 10 minute log files, 24 hours a day, five days a week, that's going to mount up into quite a big um, saving. You can also take the output from backup DBA database and push it across. So perhaps you just want to duplicate a database um, for your devs. They've asked for a copy. So we're just going to back up a database and push it through. So here we can take restore time clean, restore it as restore time clone, push the files into locations. Here we go. If we go into here, yep, we have a nice restore time clone database already for the devs. Um, or if you want to practice a migration, so again, we pull a backup from SQL Express 2012 and we push it through to restore it back on the 2016 instance. There we go. Now these, when you're pushing between different instances, there is a reliance that you can see the same storage on both instances. Um, so obviously, this is all on my C drive, so it's not a problem. But if you're restoring from server A to server B, you'd need to make sure you're backing up to some shared storage that both instances could see. And the good thing is, because we only use copy-only backups by default for the backup DBA database, there's no impact on the original database's restore chain. So you can just run this. you impact because you're taking up I.O., obviously, but you're not going to break your restore chain. You can just clone it across quite quickly. Um, and of course, this is DBA tools. Why are we going to stop with just one? Let's back up two databases and push them across to a new instance. So there we go two databases very quickly pushed across into a new version of SQL Server and ready for you to test your app on. So, you know, very, very quick and simple. If we just look at the two down the bottom, they're all ready to go. And that is the end of the demos. Do I have to go back to the slides? Um, yes, the last one was just repeating the Slack and the issues one. I shall go back to my contact details. There we go. If people want to um, take those down, like Chrissy was saying, I'm quite often on Slack. I've had a couple of days off just because I've been writing this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm normally hanging around on there, and GitHub issues are very, very useful. Obviously, the nice thing about doing this sort of thing is you find out all the weird and wonderful things out there that exist in backups, <laughs> and you get to work with them. So That's then, excellent, Stuart. Thank you. That was really, yeah, really that was good. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Really, Do you have really more cool. questions or anything? Nothing. Uh, Is there anything in the Slack, Chrissy? Mine's crashed, unfortunately. I know, right? My, uh, my, my thing was taking up the entire screen, and I couldn't see anything. I'm like, oh, thank God. Okay, I'm there. Let's see. Um, no, it's just, it's just you and me, man. 
we're uh, uh, well, we're in there talking. Excellent. So, awesome. Well, thank brilliant. you so much. Oh, Stuart, hang on. There, hang on. Whoa, uh, wait. Uh, Sorry. Uh, apologies. Hang on. There's the important Claudio. Claudio, please ask your question. Here he goes. He says, what about I it? have one. What about, so it's a cliffhanger. We don't know hang what on. about yet. Bit of a drum roll. Using, Using SQL, SQL authentication. authentication. Using SQL yes. authentication, Stuart. Yep, absolutely fine. It supports the normal, um, Mm. The, the usual DBA tool SQL credential things. So, yeah, you put whatever credential you want to connect with there. I'm just, I just do it all with the Windows also. But yeah. Ditto. So, so what you saw in his demo was uh, it, it's just using Windows authentication. You can use the dash SQL credential parameter to pass both uh, alternative Windows credentials and SQL credentials as well. He said that, uh, so Claudio is one of our developers and uh, and he gets that question a lot so I just want to remind people that you can use both Windows authentication uh, and and SQL and in addition I think that it's important also whenever you're using Stuart's commands that the uh, it's important to note that the paths are relative to the SQL server itself just like when you use SQL Server Management Studio and not your local machine So someone asked about managed service accounts. Uh, can you talk more about that? I'll be right back. Managed yep. service accounts, you mean at the Active Directory level or? Yes. Could you expand a little bit, Peter? It says, it says managed service accounts. If you've... Can you see the questions pane, Stuart, in your? I'm just trying to expand it. Uh, for some reason mine it's absolutely minimal okay it says uh, managed service accounts it's a special ad account so um i'm yeah. presuming yeah I... yeah that's something yeah because no, no, normally you have them don't you? you run your sql services under a managed service account and AD controls them having a randomized password that it resets for you. Yep. I believe, yes. Yes, correct. Um, I'd say those accounts you wouldn't, shouldn't really be using to connect to a database server to do this sort of work. Because um, one, you shouldn't know the password, that's one of the points of them. Mm -hmm. And two, it's bad form because you don't know who's running the command. Um, it's like a lot of things. If everyone logs in as administrator, you don't know who dropped the database. So people should have an account you can trace. Just so you've got accountability. Yes, I um, totally agree. Claudia yeah. says. Um, Peter says if you if you're doing automation, you might want to use them. I, I think you would use them for set it for running your SQL Server, and you would make sure the permissions were there for you to your backup yeah. share I suppose, yeah but I, I suppose I if you use did them want for to, doing the backups um, yeah i suppose if I, you did want to use it for your backups you just get you just assign that the permissions to run your job and then it, that, your windows authentication would just take over so running yeah. scheduled task i don't know if you can assign the permissions to that user um and then yeah uh, that should just pass it through um, Claudia says, how deep can you go in a folder level for the restore and the backup commands, for the restore commands, I presume? Um, with our default file readers, if you just give it a directory path, it only scans that folder. If you give it Hellengren, the, sorry, the maintenance solution backups, other scripts, it will recurse only into the full, the log, and the diff folders. XPDS tree currently um recurses down the entire tree um so everything under the folder and obviously because you can pipe in the output from gci so get child item you can go as deep as you want there is nothing to stop you piping in the entire c drive of a machine it'll probably sit there for a long time scanning all the files and kicking out the ones that aren't sql backups but you could do it 
I, I've done. I've, I did this. Eat, well, I was dog fooding this. One did some migrations earlier this year, and I recursed into 102 folders, all containing Hallengren type backups to migrate stuff across cluster instances, and it didn't mind doing that. It just takes so, some time to process the files. Yeah. <laughs> Crikey. Um, is it possible to ship the SSISDB in the backup restore function? You My could certainly is, yeah, that you can do it, but it 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 totally boned a couple of my uh, my upgrades um, because it didn't yeah. set it didn't set a specific bit back. Um, you know that was like, hey, this is some sort of system database, and so my my SP update didn't recognize it. It tried to update it, and uh, and it, yeah, it was it was tough. Yeah, exactly my experience. It's a different beast. It looks like a database, but you need to have CLR enabled and that sort of business, which does not carry across. Uh, um, I'd just like to say it works with um, Linux as well. I've just run a test. And apart from my databases with um, the wrong sort of characters in them, um, it has backed up my databases successfully on Linux awesome. as well. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I didn't even test that. That's probably yeah, that's probably SMO playing up. I'd have thought. I just I just pass in what SMO wants. Um, um, but yeah, going back to SSISDB, Chris is putting a request for an enhancement to do system databases. Woo! So that could possibly mm -hmm. be on the end of that one because once we've already coped with handling master, which requires restarts and trace flags, then we should hopefully get to do the CLR enabling and do SSISDB. Excellent. Is it possible to restore the SQL Server Managed Backups MS Azure with PowerShell? Don't know. Again, that, that's one thing that's on my list of things to do, <laughs> is to investigate <laughs> that and how we can talk to Azure. Uh, you know, obviously, if you've got Azure set up in a VM out there, it's no different as long as you can get access to it. Um, but the actual SQL Azure stuff, I've not looked into too deeply. Ditto. We do have a, a new team, a team member um, who is working on some of the Azure stuff, uh, so we can pass that information on to him as well, because I would be curious. I know that I was really disappointed when just jumping into Azure in, in general. I thought that, oh, I could just back up and restore, and then it wasn't that at all. Um, and so that would be really convenient for both Linux and uh, Azure if we could take care of that for people. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because definitely at least the backing up and restoring from Azure Storage now will need doing, but there's some stuff under the hood that needs doing. So that's the server has to be configured to know all the security keys, and then it becomes easier. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of that initial setup. So I think that will be you know almost a separate piece of work because we've got the plug and play architecture now. It should be able to bolt it through. Totally. Seems like that's all that we have. Stuart, thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. That was brilliant. That's okay, no problems. And thank, thank you, you for giving uh, us an entire hour and a half of your time. That's really, uh, we really appreciate it. No, that's absolutely fine. Now I can talk about this for ages. You know, Rob, well, was I think Rob first heard the very first version of this session about eight years ago. So. Correct. Wow. That, that, that wow. Was my, that was the first session I ever presented away from my home user group. And that I ended up so having to cool. do my session on Stuart's Mac, which was uh, still. Thank you very much again, sir. Actually, I'll, I'll put that as a selling point. I'm about to sell that Mac. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been friends for uh, much longer than I knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, been, been quite a while. Yeah, I think in the UK we've got a reasonably small SQL True. user group community. Yeah, we're actually reasonably close compared to the States or Europe. So mm -hmm. I will drive down to Exeter and back for a session. And I know Rob was up last week for a PowerShell session in Nottingham. I forgot about. <laughs> in fact, less than 50 meters from where I'm sat now. Oh no! Hmm. Right. Can somebody press stop recording, and we will All right. wrap this one up. Oh, yeah, and I, and, I, and it, fortunately, this this week uh, it's been a lot better. Um, as far as our, our video and audio uh, 
quality has, has gone. So I don't think that I'll need your session, um, Stuart, but please do convert it, and then I'll let you know if it, if it didn't come through for me. Yeah, I'm just so trying to find out where it's where it's gone. It, it'll uh, it'll pop up once the uh, once the webinar has completed entirely. It'll pop pop up and say, "Do you want us to convert it now?" 